Good morning. So we welcome you this morning on behalf of St. Paul's Evangelical Lutheran Church here at 445 Elmwood Avenue. And it is with a, a special joy that I say that we are now coming to the, the last Sunday in the month of April, which means that in the first Sunday of May, we will be reopening the sanctuary for worship and we're looking forward to seeing you, that's for sure. We will be following the guidelines by the CDC. We will have every other pew roped off in some way or another. We will still require masks, of course, and will require the social distancing in the pews. There will be no fellowship in the fellowship hall at this time. And uh, if you need to use a bathroom, please, we'll be using the bathroom strictly downstairs in the front of the church. Otherwise, for handicapped, of course, they can access through the fellowship hall. And we're looking forward to this as, again, we will have the one door open, the main doors of the church, and the office door for the rent, of course. And we will ask that you'll use simply the center aisle, and we will not be utilizing either side aisle for coming in and going out. And we will usher people out so that we maintain the social distancing. You're getting all of this in a nice letter from, from the council, and that was all decided. But I thought I would just kind of bring it up because I'm excited about it and looking forward to it. Looking forward to seeing you next Sunday, not this coming Sunday, but May 2nd. So with that, God bless you. Thank you for all of the support and all that's been done. I especially want to thank Gigi and Noel for all that they did to make this possible. And we now have the opportunity to bring you a live service, and that will be put onto the, uh, onto the Facebook group page as well for your, for your pleasure. If you feel uncomfortable still with coming to church, for instance, or if you're unable to make church. So that's a special gift from God. And we thank Noel as he's going to be going forward with that, and Gigi as she'll be mastering the organ as usual and other instruments, of course. And then we're going to gear up and hopefully in the near future, in the very near future, maybe by the end of the year, <laughs> maybe a choir, and maybe all sorts of wonderful things that we go back into a church, just a brief choir, you know, once in a while, just to sing together, or whatever was done in the past. So with that, thank you very much. God bless you. And we look forward to seeing you. Good morning. Please join me in singing hymn number 501. He leadeth me, O blessed Son.
We'll make our beginning in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please join me with me in our confession. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Eternal God, we confess that we have tried to hide from you, but we have done wrong. We have lived for ourselves, we have refused to bear the troubles of others, and have turned from our neighbors. We have ignored the pain of the world, and passed by the hungry, the poor, and the oppressed. O oh God, in your mercy, forgive our sin, and free us from selfishness, that we may choose your will, and obey your commandments. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his only Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As I call an ordained servant of the Word, I therefore forgive you your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Send us as shepherds to rescue the lost, to heal the injured, and to feed one another with knowledge and understanding. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please join with me now in a responsive reading of the 23rd Psalm the wonderful psalm that shows us Jesus Christ as our shepherd, which is today's theme, the Good Shepherd Sunday. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures, he leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul, he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 
The first lesson is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put him in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers, elders, and teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and the other men of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. He is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Here ends the first lesson. The second lesson is taken from the book of 1 John, chapter 3, verses 16 through 24. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. Then this is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. Those who obey his commands live in him, and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. Here ends the second lesson. According to St. John, the 10th chapter, and we read verses 11 through 18. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and they shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I laid down my life, only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. 
This command I received from my Father. This is the Gospel of our Lord.
Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. On this Good Shepherd Sunday, of course, of course, I will turn to the Gospel according to St. John. And I'll read from that Gospel from the 14th verse, just a portion again of the Gospel read earlier, where it says, and Jesus says, I am the Good Shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of the sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and they shall be one flock and one shepherd. What a moving, beautiful picture of Jesus Christ we have here as the Good Shepherd. And as we read the 23rd Psalm earlier, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We have this wonderful picture of a gracious Jesus, the loving Jesus, who reached out and helped people, who, who didn't discriminate among anyone. And that's a wonderful picture. But in reality it falls short because again we have to take it to the text and we have to take a look at what Jesus is talking about and, and, and when you bring that all together you realize that oh this was not really received very well. Well what do you mean it wasn't received very well? It wasn't received very well because the leaders of the church didn't want to hear this kind of a message about God the Father being gracious, kind and full of love and forgiveness. Jesus, I've said it many times, was a radical rabbi. He was a radical rabbi in the way he treated all people. He was a radical rabbi in that he didn't differentiate among people as we should behave today. And not look at this group or that group and say this group is different than that group, etc., etc. Jesus went to everyone, one and the same. And he called in a revolutionary way he called for a brand new perspective on how to see God the Father, the Lord and Creator of this world. His steadfast proclamation of God the Father was one of God's love and God's forgiveness and of God's acceptance of all people. And this, this just did not go well with the hypocritical legalism and the self-righteousness of the institutional church leaders of the day, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They were the leaders. They were by tradition. They had been for many, many, many years. And they had set the picture of God the Father as being a God of wrath. A God who expected this kind of a behavior to get this closer to heaven and that closer and that closer and that closer and that closer and, that closer, and no one no one really could reach that, and that's why the Pharisees like to pat themselves on the back. And the Sadducees as well, thinking they were pretty good in the sight of God. Whereas, well, common people, no, not much of a chance. Jesus' message ran right into the face of these church leaders, and he tackled them. He tackled them with the love of God, of all things. And they didn't like it. This, this good shepherd Jesus, well, he was not very well received by the leaders, these hardcore leaders of the institutional church. People traditionally looked to the Pharisees. As I said before, they expected, they expected to see from the Pharisees what they needed to do. They expected to see from the Sadducees what they needed to be taught. They expected, and they expected, and they expected. And these leaders, they delivered all right. They delivered in such a way that they could make themselves look good and pompous and wonderful and so much better than the common people or especially of, of another nation. You know, there was no acceptance of the Gentiles. It was just the Jewish people, and even they, most of them, wouldn't step up to that grade. This is what Jesus was struggling against in his ministry. This is what Jesus was struggling about, just as we struggle today to get the message across that all people 
are accepted in the sight of God. And God does not differentiate among people. God has no favorites among people. The only favoritism God shows is to those that love Jesus Christ as his Savior or her Savior. And that, of course, brings them to heaven and eternal life. But God would that all people come to that knowledge, and God would that all people are treated equally and treated the same, without differentiation, without a different set of rules. God loves all people, and that is the picture that we have in the Good Shepherd. Jesus, coming before the spiritual leaders of the day, he was throwing out a, a picture of something that the people hadn't seen. The people expected to hear what they were supposed to do, how they were supposed to act, how they were supposed to dress from the institutional church. And then Jesus, on the other hand, is saying, all of that stuff does not matter. Only that you love God the Father as the Creator who sent me as the Savior into the world. The promised Messiah from the beginning of all time. God loves you. God forgives you. God wants you to be a part, a total part of this package. As Jesus says, there are many, many sheep who did not belong in this one particular pen, but they will all be treated equally and brought into one flock. And that's what Jesus was trying to proclaim day by day by day. And then Jesus, of course, in his own radical sort of way, continued to push this into the face of the, of the church leaders until they decided to get rid of him. And that was their best shot. Let's get rid of him. And that's the picture that we have when we read, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of the sheep pen. I must bring them also. Look at the, the drama in that picture. Look at the radical Jesus. Love him for standing up against the authorities of the day. Hold tight to him because he brings you to God the Father. And then he goes on to say, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in another way, is a thief and abandoned. In other words, there's only one way to God the Father. There's only one way to salvation. And that's through Jesus Christ as your Lord, as your personal Savior, through his death and through his resurrection. There's all sorts of proclamations about the church, but this is the one proclamation, the saving grace of Jesus Christ, that he proclaimed day by day by day. Repent and believe in the gospel, Jesus would say. And this teaching greatly, greatly threatened the Pharisees because the people were not used to hearing the idea that a church leader should be like a, a genuine shepherd who cares where, let's see, each one counts. No one is better than another. They hadn't heard that message for years and years and years. It's called the grace and the love of God the Father. And that's what Jesus was proclaiming until they finally tried to, to put him on the cross and kill him, get rid of him. But God the Father's love for his Son, the one true Son of God, born of the Virgin Mary, God the Father's love raised him on the third day with the power of God within him and the power of the Holy Spirit. And that was the power that overpowered the institutional church as Jesus Christ came forward and said, By grace you're saved through faith. So then, as we have this picture of this good shepherd, are you ready to listen to him? It's easy to pick up a Bible and read a few verses. 
But if you listen carefully to the Word of God, and if you listen to the call of the sacraments, you're going to hear, first of all, He calls you to turn to God in the times of trouble, and to turn to God for guidance. Secondly, He says that you are called to give the voice of God the highest priority in life. And third, Jesus says in his calling, come follow me. Come follow me where I lead. And that means perhaps a brand new perspective for a lot of people who have to look at all people as equal. Because Jesus is calling people to be one flock. And Jesus is calling people to help one another, and to love one another, and to care for one another. Not to be divisive, not to be pointing fingers, not to be condemning, but to be loving, and forgiving, and accepting, and trying with all your power to bring people together. Love your neighbor as yourself was the great commandment Jesus gave. So this behavior, I think, for many, for far too many, means that they have to have a new way of looking at other people without looking for divisions, without looking for differences, but to look to other people in order to help them and to offer assistance where you can. Just imagine to find somebody that's in need of help, or someone that looks like they're a little bit in trouble, even if it's a relative, or a friend who doesn't go to church. And imagine now, being in that situation as Jesus, and that person is in trouble, and you come to the person, and you actually listen to what they have to say, instead of talking. Listen carefully to the problems that they have and be willing to help. And then, and this is the scary part, to that same person that's, that's now in trouble and confiding in you a little bit, now you have the opportunity to say, can I have a prayer for you right now? Would you like to fold your hands with me and ask God for help? I'll lead the prayer. Please, just fold your hands and I'll pray with you. If that doesn't happen, well, then the door is closed. And what I mean by that is Jesus Christ is the door to life. And God opens doors here and he closes doors there. And if you follow his guidance, and you hear his voice calling you, then you're being called to witness to the love of Jesus Christ and to offer assistance when needed. And if you have that ability, and if that opportunity is there, that means the door is open. <laughs> that means you have the ability to step through the door and say, I'll have a prayer for you. On the other hand, if the individual feels a little off guard about it, if the individual doesn't bring up the possibility, if the individual says no to you wanting to offer a prayer, that means the door is closed for the moment. And at that point, you simply say, that's okay, I understand, but I'm here to help you. What can I do for you? That's the calling of Jesus Christ. When dealing with people who have problems, I've long ago learned that they rely on themselves far too much in their own resources. And what I mean by that is that they don't turn to God for help. They turn to other people, they turn to themselves, they turn to everybody and everything except to quietly fold their hands and say, Lord God, I'm in trouble. Lord God, I'm dealing with pain. Lord God, 
My children are in trouble. Lord God, my life is upside down. Help me. There's where you find your help and your strength to go on to the next day. And God will provide that help through Jesus Christ, our Lord. He promises that. And again, if you, if you yourself need that help and not somebody else, then stop worrying. Don't stress out, as they say. Quietly, you quietly go to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord God, I'm in trouble. I need help today. Please offer me help. You're my good shepherd. Lead me in the paths of righteousness. Give me strength at least to deal with the problems that I've got so that I can get to tomorrow. Heavenly Father, help me. That's the kind of help that I'm directing you toward. And that's the kind of help that I direct so many other people toward. Jesus was trying over and over again to get people to listen to that simple message that God is love, that God is caring, that God watches over you, that God will help you. But there were so many voices around, pounding him out. Loud voices, just like in our society. You have so many things going on, so many activities. You've got your job. You've got school. You've got your home problems. You've got this, you've got that, and these voices are loud, 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 and it drowns out, it drowns out the voice of God. Where you can simply say, Lord God, help me. And quietly allow him to remove some of those things from your shoulders. You know, let go. Let go and give it to the Lord in prayer. He'll answer that prayer. Thieves and robbers. That's what we deal with in so many cases today, where we have people telling us this and people telling us that, and we don't really know what to do. There's a scam here, there's a scam there. It comes in this way, it comes in that way. You have to be very, very careful. And that's also what Jesus has always said. Look among you and listen. Don't jump right into something. Listen carefully to what's being said and then pray about it and ask for guidance and seek out help from those who love the Lord to help you because they won't lead you astray. Then you can make a decision and then most likely you will make the right decision. Move forward in the grace and in the love of God. Be careful but be always, be always assured that when things go wrong, and if you make wrong choices, Jesus Christ is there to help, and Jesus Christ is there to forgive and to give you another chance to make another choice. That's the beautiful thing of the grace of God. It continually comes out and offers another chance and another chance and another chance to people like me who many times have needed another chance. Thanks be to God for our Lord Jesus Christ. It is important of all things on Good Shepherd Sunday. It is important to understand that the grace of God can cause a radical change in one's outlook in life. A brand new perspective that sees life dedicated first of all to Jesus Christ and then second of all to all people that are around you. Love your neighbor as yourself, Jesus says. And if you love God and you love your neighbor, God will take care of you. That's a promise in the scripture. That comes from the, the Good Shepherd. In the name of Jesus Christ, Amen.
Now may the peace of God that passeth all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Depart in God's peace. Amen. I now invite you to join with me in confessing your faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge both the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. invite you now to join with me in our prayer of thanksgiving and we'll do so by starting saying merciful father we will offer the joy and thanksgiving, thanksgiving which, which you have first given us ourselves our time and our possessions signs of your gracious love receive them for the sake of him who offers himself for us jesus christ our lord amen join with me now in the lord's prayer our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.